kind of the back. So I need to, yeah, it's really difficult with a tie mic because surprisingly enough, I don't wear a tie. Yeah, that's great. I can hear that better. Thank you very much. Well, it's lovely, lovely, lovely to be here again and to see you all. And I, some faces are vaguely familiar. Last time I came here, I was dressed in my summer dress with my sandals and it was absolutely roasting hot. And uh, it's freezing, isn't it? Absolutely freezing. I can't believe it. Who thinks it's going to snow? I think it's going to snow. Now, one of the things I have to tell you is that if I, um, if I ask you a question, generally I like a little bit of, you know, I don't like heckling, don't heckle me, don't, don't, don't be shouting, you know, get off, get off, all that kind of stuff, but um, you know, I do like a little bit of discussion sometimes and a little bit of feedback, so it uh, helps me feel more secure, okay? So you'd be doing me a favour, and also I know that you're still awake and you haven't fallen asleep. So I've got um, something that I feel that the Lord has said to me about this. Uh, just about this evening that I should bring this evening, so we'll get on to that. But why don't we just pray for the Word of God now. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. And we thank you that your Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. That it teaches us the way that you want us to go, Lord. And Father, I just want to thank you for this church and thank you for all of these hearts and minds that love you and are for you and are thinking about you. And Lord, I just pray that you'll bless us and feed us as we come to your word tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you've got your Bibles, do you want to turn them on or turn over to um, John 21? I'm impressed. I'm impressed. And there's nothing like flicking through the pages of the Bible, is there? There's nothing like it. John 21, yeah. Gospel of John, my favourite gospel. And uh, I think it's one of the most touchy-feely gospels. Um, and I, I love it. And there's loads of words in red. There's loads of words of Jesus in there. And John covers some stuff that the other three gospels don't cover. And um, I want to talk to you tonight about relationship relationship now i said to somebody oh i got the feedback is that you lord um i said to somebody i'm going to talk about relationship and love and they kind of went oh, as if to say oh not all that poppy stuff i'm not going to talk about well i'm going to talk about all sorts of relationship mostly relationship with god okay and relationship with one another because oh, i won't start now let's be ordered okay and I, I'm going to do that, I might bring in, in the spirit of true relationship, I might bring in something of my story of the last few years, um, in the spirit of true relationship. But let's see kind of how it goes. So um, if we start at verse 15, you'll know this passage if you've been kicking around church any length of time. And it says, when they had finished eating, this is Jesus and the disciples, this is after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, before he goes to heaven, and he's, he's, he meets with his disciples several times. It's quite a, I think if I was to go back to a time in history, this would be the time that I'd love to go back to, because, you know, there's appearances of Jesus all over the place, and uh, people are coming out of their tombs, and all sorts of things are happening. And, uh, you know, it's not kind of your normal run-of-the-mill stuff. And bearing in mind that the Jews has had, had had 400 years of nothing, and then all of a sudden, all of this stuff is going on. So, um, this is what's happening right now. And Jesus has appeared again to his disciples, and the story is that the disciples have gone back to what they know. They've gone back to fishing because they didn't know what else to do. What else are you supposed to do when like, all your dreams are blown and the person that you thought was going to be the saviour and was going to reinstate Israel and all that stuff, well, he's gone, so what do I do? Well, I go back to what I know, which is understandable. And so they've been fishing and Jesus has met them on the beach and he's cooked fish for them. 
Do you know, I hate fish. I can't stand it. I just can't stand it anywhere near me. If it's within 12 foot of me, I can smell it. and It makes me want to gag. I just hate it so much. Is there anybody with me? Amen. Ooh, make a club. Okay. So perhaps a really good reason why I wasn't born in this era is that I just go, no, thanks, Jesus, you're all right. I'll just have the bread. <laughs> So, um, verse 15 says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, Do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Okay, we're going to finish there. And the next bit is a great sermon on comparison. Never heard anybody preach it, but it it deserves to be preached. But we're we're just going to stop there. Talking about relationship, I heard the story of a man who lost his wife. His wife died after many happy years of marriage and he was quite lonely. So he thought, I know what I'll do, I'll get a pet. I don't blame you because it's getting on my nerves. Is that better? Okay. Um, what I'll do is I'll get a pet because I'm, I'm kind of lonely, so I'll get a pet. Okay. This is a joke, by the way. If you've heard the punchline, don't spoil it. All right. So he thought, I'll get, I'll get a pet. And so he went to the local pet shop and um, he said to the man behind the counter, look, I've lost my wife, I'm really, really lonely. Uh, I was wondering if you had any parrots in store because they talk and they're good company. It's a bit like having a three-year-old continuously for about 100 years, but they might be good company. And so um, the man in the pet shop said, sorry, I'm all out of parrots, he said, but I'll tell you what I have got. I'll do you a fantastic deal on, because he came from ethics like me, I'll do you a fantastic deal on centipede. And the guy said, a centipede? And he said, yeah, he said, I've got these amazing centipedes in, he said. What they are, he said, they're specially bred and trained that they'll do whatever you want them to do. So the guy thinks, oh, this is just going to be like having my wife back again. No, that was an add-on bit. So the guy thought, oh, that sounds really, really great. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll buy a centipede. So he thought, let's give it a go. So the guy in the pet shop said, all you've got to do is you've got to make him a nice, comfy bed somewhere in the house so that he knows which is his space. That's all he's going to want is, is this. So basically, he takes this centipede home and he makes a nice little bed beside the kitchen door and nice and comfortable and uh, the centipede goes in and he sniffs and he he sort of crutches himself down and he says oh that's great and um the man says okay thinks okay let's let's give this a go so uh he he goes in the kitchen and he says oh i'd really like a good cup of tea so the centipede goes right and he gets up climbs up onto the worktop and makes him a cup of tea. By now, if I hadn't told you that this was a joke, you would have clicked, right? And uh, so he makes him this wonderful cup of tea, carries in the mug of steaming tea into the man who's sitting in the lounge, and uh, the man thinks, oh, this is, this is amazing. So uh, he thinks, right, well, I'm going to try this out again. He says, uh, I think I'll go up for a nice shower now. Centipede goes, right. Crawls up the stairs, takes him a while, but he crawls up the stairs and he goes in the shower bathroom. You have to suspend your like reality, yeah? You've got that? So he goes into the bathroom and he turns on the shower and there's this beautiful hot shower and he turns on the radiator and he puts a big fluffy towel on the radiator and then he leaves it a couple of minutes and he goes back down the stairs again and he says to the man, okay, you can go now. And the man thinks, this is amazing. 
I can see a few of you. You're going, where can I get that centipede, aren't you? And, and the man thinks, this is amazing. This is amazing. So uh, he says to the centipede, right, he says, whilst I'm up in the shower, will you go to the shop? Oh, maybe I shouldn't have told this joke here. Will you go to the shop and get me a couple of cans of Coca-Cola? <laughs> so centipede goes, right. So the man gives him a five pound note. Centipede takes it in his mouth, goes into the kitchen. Man goes upstairs into the shower and uh, has a lovely shower, comes down. No centipede, no Diet Coke. And the man waits and he waits another 15 minutes and he thinks, it's a bit like this joke goes on for 15 minutes. And then he thinks, well, that centipede, that rotten centipede, he's stolen my five pound note and I bet he's gone back to that shopkeeper. And he goes into the kitchen and there's the centipede sitting beside his bed where all his belongings are. And he says to the centipede, what are you doing? Why haven't you been around the corner and got my, my Coca-Cola? And the centipede says, hang on a minute, give me a chance to get my shoes on. <laughs> was it worth waiting for, was it? Was it, was it? <laughs> but what that joke does do is it shows us that as human beings, we have a need for relationship. Now, I grew up in a culture in the 70s and the 80s where independence was 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 lauded you don't need anybody what you need to do is you need to learn to be independent because if you can learn to be independent then you can survive anything and we've had a culture of that we've had a culture of that but actually you know the human being is wired like it or not for relationship and the reason they're wired for relationship is because God created them in his image and God is a God of relationship. Now, I'm going to clarify in a minute what sort of relationship I'm talking about, but just to say, I'm talking about all sorts of relationship. In fact, you know, in the Bible, the most precious relationships were friendships. Not marriages, friendships. Bearing in mind you could give your wife a certificate of divorce and send her away, it's not surprising that friendships formed the closest relationships. And we are actually wired for relationship. As well as being a, a minister with the Elam Pentecostal Church, um, I'm also um, a counsellor and I'm at the moment training to be a psychotherapist. Can I have a ooh? <laughs> Thank you. But what I'm actually learning is so much and we do a lot of work around the human brain. So a lot of the stuff that we have thought in the past was a little bit dodgy, was a little bit risky as Christians, you know, and we're not really sure about this meditation stuff, this mindfulness stuff, we're not really sure about that. But actually, if you actually look at the physical way that God has designed our brain, it all makes perfect sense. And I sit in my psychotherapy classes hearing all of this stuff going, wow, this is awesome. This just confirms that I am indeed fearfully and wonderfully made. And when I went on the course, I got questioned, do you think this course will challenge your faith? I said, well, if it does, it does. I'm not afraid of that. But all it does is confirm my faith, that I am actually created by an amazing God. It is completely amazing. I could go on and on and on about it. I'm not going because I've spent too long on the joke already. But it is completely amazing. And, um, but one of the things that we are designed for is relationship. And the imprint is there in our brain. We need one another. Like it or not, we need one another. And it was as I began to grow old and get older, as we all do, um, I realized that my life was becoming more and more and more isolated. And I, I didn't understand why. I didn't understand what was happening to me. And maybe some of you have experienced this. And I began a quest for relationship. The other thing that I noticed was I've been a Christian 30 years, had quite a radical salvation, walked into a, an Anglican church and uh, went to this Anglican church for a few weeks. And then after a few weeks, just had this absolute conviction that Jesus died for me, that I was a sinner, that it was my fault that he went to the cross, crying and crying and crying and crying. 
And then uh, he took me off to India where I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was very biblical on a roof of a house in India surrounded by palm trees. And I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amazing. But I began to say, God, I don't understand because I really believe in you and I believe in your word. But when I look at my life, am I really to believe that you want me not in relationship? That you want my relational world to become smaller? And I took his word to him one day and I literally said, God, this is your word. I believe in it. But for me, it doesn't work. And he said, I'm really glad you said that. Because now you've said that, we're really, really, really in relationship. You're not pretending anymore. You're not coming and telling me how grateful you are for my word, which I am. But you're actually saying, sorry God, this doesn't work for me and I don't understand. And that's a real relationship. That's a genuine, authentic relationship. And I've been in relationship with God for, like I say, 30 years. And I would say I had a relationship with him. I have a relationship with him. But it has just soared. But it hasn't all been happy. But it hasn't all been happy. It's been difficult, to be honest with you. So we know that God is a God of relationship, don't we? Uh, if we look at, um, you know, the Bible, we see God in relationship with himself, the Trinity, the Spirit. If ever there's a, a, a signal that God is a God of relationship, we could just stop right there. Weird, huh? In relationship with himself. Well, you might say that, but if you study psychotherapy, you begin to understand the Trinity and the parts a whole lot more. It's fascinating. But there's a model for us. Then God in Genesis, what does he do? He creates humankind. Why? Just relationship. He didn't have to. Actually, the truth is he doesn't need us. Huh, big shock. But he chose to create us simply to be in relationship with us. We have the accounts, don't we, of God walking in the garden with Adam and chatting to him, and probably Eve was there as well, but chatting to him. They would chat. Come on, you've got to be a bit jealous about that, haven't you? <laughs> and then, of course, the fall came, and that relationship was broken. A picture of society, I would like to suggest. If you look throughout the Old Testament, you'll see God being interested in relationship. Uh, I was reading Isaiah 58 recently, and it's a, a passage of scripture that talks about, you know, you have, um, you know, you fast, and you say that you're seeking me, but actually all you're doing is this religious behavior, because you don't care about the poor and you don't care about the needy. You're just going through the motions thinking that that's good enough. And I'm sick of it. That's what God says. Because God doesn't want that. He doesn't need us to go through the motions of religion. He wants relationship. And he doesn't just want us to have relationship with him. He wants us to have relationship with one another. And so we see it all the way through the Bible. Relationship, 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 relationship. If I can concentrate on my relationship with God, if I can concentrate on being in relationship with him, everything else will fall into place. We're going to look at this passage in a minute. I haven't forgotten about the passage, but we're going to look at the word love. You can't talk about relationships and not talk about love in, in Christian circles. But the first thing I want to do is introduce you to a guy who I think you'll love called Martin 
Buber. I always get his surname wrong. Now, Martin Buber isn't alive anymore. Martin Buber was a philosopher. Okay, don't, don't turn off, just, just wait. The great thing about Martin Buber was he was a Jewish philosopher. And he was very interested in the dynamic of relationship. He's one of the foremost people who's ever written on relationship. And he introduced this concept of an I-thou relationship. Has anybody ever heard of that term? Okay. An I-thou relationship or an I-it relationship. And basically what he's talking about is when I, I can't say an I-you relationship because that's not profound enough, so I say an I-thou relationship because that brings a sense of profoundness about the relationship. And an I-it relationship is very necessary. It's what happens when the elders get together and they discuss uh, how we're going to go forward. You know, when you all rush along to your AGM, you know, when we say AGM in our church, we all go, oh, like that. I noticed she didn't do that, so well done. But you're all going to rush along to your AGM and you're all going to make some decisions and that is an I-it relationship. It's a necessary relationship to get things done. And there's a whole spectrum. But the really profound relationship is the I-thou relationship. It's the sort of relationship where you can sit in a room with someone and you just know each other. And you don't have to say anything. You might know what the other person is thinking because you know them so well and you know how they're going to respond. And you know what they're going to say. You know what they're thinking. That's an I-thou relationship. And this is the relationship that God wants with you and me. You see, he's already doing his part. He already knows that when you sit in a room with him, what you're thinking. And some of us get quite scared about that, you know, because I'm a sinner and all that. Well, let me tell you, you're a, you're a son and a daughter of God. That's what you are. You're a saint. You're wearing royal robes that you don't deserve. That's your true identity. So when Christ comes and you sit with him, and by the way, if you never come and just sit with him, then you ought to try it sometime. And the first thing that you'll need to do is shut your mind off, because your mind will go off in all different directions. And lists of things that you need to do. The only, only time I ever feel like doing housework is when it comes to having a quiet time. If I decide I'm going to have a day with the Lord, it turns into a day of housework. It's really hard to do. But if you just sit with God, he knows. And do you know what else? He knows that for years and years and years I was saying, well, I don't know about this Bible God. I've believed in your word and I've believed in you and still believe in you. I follow you all of my life and I stand that, say that as a testimony before you. Whatever happens, I will follow you, Jesus. He knew that I was going, but your word, it doesn't work. And so when I finally said it, he said, I'm really glad you said that, because I already know that, you see. And that's an I-thou relationship. Not that I've got it hands down, I haven't. It's a depth of relationship. It's not just a, oh, I'm saved and in the kingdom. You know, some of you, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But what I want to try and do is communicate the depth of relationship that God wants to have with us. And then with that relationship comes power. I used to think that if I spent time with God and and got in relationship with him, then I'd have like a fantastic healing ministry. (coughs) Well, that's the wrong reason. Let me tell you, God knows what you're thinking. When you come in here and you say, hello, hello, how are you? Praise the Lord, isn't it all great? God knows. He knows. The difficulty is that there should be some other people in your fellowship who know too. Because you should be having, I should be having, I as our relationship with people in my fellowship. Because God puts us in a family for a reason. 
Not so that we can all come in and show off, pretend how spiritual we are, and that we don't have any questions or difficulties about, God, why doesn't your Bible work for me? Oh, but praise God, hallelujah. Yeah, I can still say praise God, hallelujah. In fact, there were many months where I couldn't say praise God, hallelujah. When we would sing songs about how God is faithful to his promises, and I'd sit there and think, no, you're not. (coughs) But he knew I was thinking that, and so I just got it out there. I was just really honest. And let me tell you, it caused the biggest breakthrough in my life ever. The healing journey I have been on is incredible. And let me tell you, the only person who wanted me to stay in that place was the devil. Because it's in being honest and getting out there and getting real with God that the strongholds that the enemy planted in my life that I knew nothing about, they've been broken down. You see, the relationship is so important. We talk very often about the relationship between husband and wife, spending time together, blah de blah de blah de blah It's all true, it's all right, it's all God, good. And why is that? And it's all God as well. But why is that? Because if I'm going to have relationship, I've got to be real. I've got to be open, but that doesn't mean that I come in and I share my heart with everyone in the church. It means that I pick someone that I can trust. You know, the Apostle Paul, he wrote to one of the churches, it might have been actually in Timothy, where he said, pray for me. Pray for me that I can still have the courage, this is what he was saying, he was in prison, that I can still have the courage to preach the gospel. Pray for me. But yet we think that the really spiritual thing to do is to come in and go, oh, I'm fine, praise God, hallelujah, everything's really, really great. Unless I have something acceptable that I can tell you about. And it stinks. It absolutely stinks. Because God is interested in relating. So let's go back to our scripture. You know that Peter, this is Peter being reinstated. And he's um, just coming back from denying the Lord. I mean, you know, that's a biggie, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. Have you ever done anything comparable? But God always restores. He always restores. He's not interested in condemnation. He's not interested in casting you out of his presence. He's not interested in any of that. He didn't die for that. He could have done that without dying. He's interested in restoration, in promise, in future, in all the wonderful things that he prophesies over you. And so some of you will know that when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He uses two different words. Some of you know this. So the first two times he says, do you love me? The word love, he uses the word agape, yeah. He uses the word agape. And this word is the highest form of all of the four four types of love that you find in the Bible. It defines God's, listen to this, immeasurable, incomparable love for humankind. It's the divine love that comes from God. Agape, as I call it because I'm from Essex, love is perfect, unconditional, sacrificial, and pure. And Jesus challenges his Peter and he says, will you love me like this? And what does Peter respond? You know I love you. And what's the word that Peter uses? Yeah, the word is um, philo of, I've got philia, philia. And that is a different word to agape. And and he says, Lord, you know I philia you. You know. So he uses a different term.
And the word philia is a type of intimate love in the Bible, and this is what my notes say, that most Christians practice towards each other. The Greek term describes, listen to this, this is how we should be relating to one another, the powerful emotional bond seen in deep friendships. When Jesus said, you'll know, people will know that you're my disciples by the fact that you do loads of evangelism. No. He said, people will know that you're my disciples by the way that you love one another. This is what he was talking about. The way that you have those deep, meaningful friendships. Friendships? It's not eros. It's friendships. And that's how the church should be. But again, you, you can't put a should on this. You can't put a relationship tag on this because that turns it into an I-it relationship, not an I-thou relationship. It's got to be genuine. And there are some people in the room that you know better than other people. And that's really good. But it's by the love that we show for one another that people will know that we're Jesus' followers. And then when they come in and we show them that love, not just for 10 weeks until they get their lives right, but unconditionally, deeply, whatever, I'll be with you. I'll take your hand and I'll run with you. I'll run this season with you. I'll run this bit of the race with you. That's how we should be. That's why the disciples spent time in each other's houses and sold their fields and all of that kind of stuff. So Peter returns Jesus' agape with philia. And he's saying, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I have a deep bond with you. And a lot of us are there, aren't we? We have a deep bond. And then the third time, what's the word that Jesus uses when he says, Peter, son of whatever, do you love me? What's the word he uses? Philia. So he stops using agape and he starts using philia. And then the command is the same. The command, the call, the mission that he's going to give to Peter, that he is giving to Peter, is the same. Whether Peter can match up to Agape or whether he can't. The mission is still the same. You're going to be head of my church. You need to feed my lambs. You need to feed my sheep. Peter, I'm giving you this commission. But Peter can't say, Lord, I Agape you. And do you know what's really great? There's two things that are really great. The first thing is that Peter's really honest about this, probably because he's learned his lesson back here, where he said, Lord, I'll die with you. I'll go to the cross with you, and then he didn't. So he thinks, oh God, well, I might as well be real then. And he says, Lord, yeah, I do love you. You know I love you, but you know I'm not quite ready for unconditional sacrificial love, don't you? But the commission still comes. The call still comes. Peter doesn't have to be perfect. Jesus gives the commission and he has full intention that that is what Peter is gonna is gonna happen to Peter. And then the other amazing thing is that when Jesus uses the word philia and not the word agape, he is meeting Peter where Peter is. He's meeting him where he is with the intention of taking him on. He said, Peter, feed my sheep and follow me. Oh, but what about him, Lord? Never mind about him. You follow me. There's a sense of movement. I'll meet you where you are because you've been real with me so I can and let's move on. There's a statement of intent. And in fact, we see that even stronger in the last verse that I read, where Jesus prophesies to Peter. 
and he prophesies the way that he's going to die. Great prophecy, thanks Lord. But he's prophesying a whole lot more than that. He says, when you get older, people are going to take hold of you and they're going to tie you up and they're going to take you where you don't want to go. And scripture says that was prophesying the sort of death that, Je- that Peter would die to glorify Jesus. And that's agape. And Jesus was saying, I'm going to take you from Phileas to agape. You can't do it right now. But in our relationship, in your acknowledgement of where you are, I'm going to take you from Phileas. And one day, you're going to be in agape. You're going to be where I need you to be. But the call is still there. Actually, what made the difference to Peter? What made the difference to him? The Holy Spirit. When Peter received the Holy Spirit, he stood up and he spoke boldly, didn't he? And he never stopped. Well, there were some some issues around, you know, like, should Gentiles be saved and all of that kind of stuff, and he got into some of that muddier waters, but actually he never stopped. He never stopped. You see, Jesus says, I'm going to meet you where you are when you're honest with me. And I'm going to walk with you to where I need you to be and where I want you to be. And actually, probably where you'd like to be too. So all of those things that you say, God, I can't, I can't do it. I, I just can't do it. And we put a lot of stock in Christianity in, you know, praising God when you don't feel like it. And that's absolutely right. But I've got to the stage where I say, God, I know I need to praise you today, but I don't feel like it. So I'm going to make the effort, but will you help me? Will you take me from where I am right now? And will you bring me into the courts of praise? You see, there's an honesty. God, I don't feel like going to church tonight. I said to Avisha, honestly, why would you have church on such a freezing cold night? There'll be nobody there. So well done. And it's about being really honest. And actually, Jesus said, rivers of living water will flow out of me. But while I'm struggling and striving and actually pretending that I don't feel the way I do about a few things, thank you very much, God, there ain't going to be rivers of living water. That's not going to be relational, that's going to be performance. And performance stinks. Isaiah, you do all this performance stuff, but actually you don't care about the stuff that is important. You know, I really believe that Jesus wants to bring revival to Wales. And it's a passion I have, and I actually... um, I actually have decided today that I'm probably called to focus on the second coming of Jesus. We sung a song this morning in church. Now, what I'm going to share with you is probably going to shock you, but don't let it shock you, okay, because I'm not going to go and do anything stupid. But And it was, well, we were reading a psalm. It was Psalm 37, and it was about the Lord, and it finished off with saying, because uh, I'm going to be honest with you because we're in relationship, okay? And it was about the Lord saying, you know, if he serves me, I will give him a long life. And I thought, I don't want a long life. I don't want a long life. Why would I want to be here when I could be up there? Now, I'm not cursing myself with sickness or illness. My life is God's and I'll live for as long as he wants me to live. And maybe one day I'll be going, no, don't come back now, Jesus. I'm having such an amazing time. I've been there before. But right now I'm in a place where I go, actually, I'm all right, you know, things are all right, but I'm not particularly keen on hanging around for 90 years, thanks very much. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) That's Psalm 37, isn't it? One of the Psalms, anyway. Yeah, and okay, I'll have it, but right now, in this moment, it's cold, it's dark, it's winter. think about my wonderful friends who've all gone to heaven and are with the Lord. Why, why would I want to be here? Honestly and truthfully. But there's an honesty about that. Whereas before I think, oh, I can't think that. Mm-hmm. But I don't curse myself with it. I just be honest. <coughs> and
and I will say it. I will say, I will bless the Lord. I will serve the Lord. I will follow the Lord. I will. But sometimes I don't feel like it. And I'm honest with God about that and he helps me. And isn't that what it's supposed to be about? But do you know what else? We're meant to help one another as well. Yeah. Isn't that exciting? I still it's only really well, yeah. I'm meant to help one another as well. So when I say, oh, I don't want a long life, have you sure say, oh, don't be ridiculous. I need you, don't go anywhere. I love you. Yeah, we cheer one another on. But if we're not honest, we can't do that. We all just live in our little isolated bubble, which is exactly what the world does. And it gets us nowhere. We're sick of it as a society. We are sick of it. The church needs to be different. And I believe it's when we gather in and we, we decide that we're going to take the risk and have that quality of relationship. Now, again, I say to you, that doesn't mean that you go splurging your stuff to everybody, okay? It means that you, you pick one or two people. I could have told you much more about my story, but I've chosen not to, because we're on live stream. So you, you're under control, you have control. Okay, so how should we respond? Because we do need to finish. So I wonder if there's anyone in the room and right now you're feeling, well, actually, I can't stand this person in this church and I can't stand this person in this church and I wish they'd all just get lost. I'm not going to ask you to go and speak to the people that you hate and ask for their forgiveness because I don't actually think that's right. I don't see that anywhere in scripture. But what I am going to ask you to do is to be honest before God about that and say, Lord, I I love the fact that you've got some training on forgiveness. You know, forgiveness is one of the most healthy brain things that you can do, scientifically. But forgiveness can take time sometimes, and you've got to be honest about that. Oh, yes, yes, I've forgiven you. Two days later, oh, I need to forgive you again. So maybe there's someone here and maybe you're feeling, oh, that's it, I'm going to leave. I've had enough, I'm done, and actually God doesn't want you to. What he wants you to do is draw close to someone and build a relationship. Maybe you're one of those people like me. I used to be like this, who says, oh, wherever I go, I just get rejected. People just reject me. No one's interested. No one wants to know. The challenge to me has been, well, start reaching out then. And not reach out and give yourself, but look for some genuine friendships and relationships. Make yourself vulnerable with someone. I remember sitting on a, a friend's sofa probably about two or three years ago and uh, she, she was talking about the kindness of God and I just was just sobbing and I just said, well, you might have experienced God as kind, but right now I don't think he's kind at all. And she just sat with me in that, where I was in that moment. And it was her sitting with me and just accepting me in my brokenness that actually enabled me to move on from that place whereas if I'd have hidden it I said oh I can't say that who knows I might still have been there so I've been really honest you probably won't ask me to come and speak again but um, (laughs) there we are (laughs) so why don't we just pray Lord, we thank you that you know everything about us. Your word says that you know when we sit down and when we get up and when we sleep and when we're awake and you know every thought and every word on our tongue before it even we even speak it. And I confess, Lord, that in the past I've seen that as, you know, um, just talking about sin. But, Lord, I don't believe that so anymore. I believe that psalm is talking about the depth of relationship that you have with us, the way that you see us, 
and the fact that you want to work with us just like you worked with Peter. But Lord, right now, we want to be a people that are open before you. And we want to be honest before you, like they were in the Bible, like David was in the Psalms, and like Job was, and like Jeremiah was. Lord, we, we just want a moment to be open with you. And if we could ask like David, Lord, would you speak? Seek into my heart. Would you look into my heart? But not looking at me as sinful, but looking at me as broken. Looking at me as hurting. Looking at me as needing something. <coughs> Lord, I... What we're going to do is we're just going to take a moment. I'm just going to give you a moment just to pray a prayer. Your prayer with God. If any of this has touched your heart, Whatever the issue is, your prayer with God, you and God right now. And Father, I thank you that you hear the cries of our hearts. And you're pleased and, in a sense, relieved when we're honest with you about those things. And I thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. Some of you, God needs you to know that uh, um, an exchange between you that isn't completely um, friendly doesn't mean the end of a relationship. That you can be real and the relationship won't end. So, Father, I just pray for every person here and myself. Lord, I ask for your grace that you would continue to walk with us, that we would continue to walk with each other. And we thank you that you created us to be relational. And where there are relationship needs in this room, Father, I just ask you right now in the name of Jesus to meet those needs or to show us how to get those needs met. We thank you that they are valid in your sight and they are precious to you in jesus name amen